From the Homestead Studios in Santa Clarita, California, it's just the tip stirs with Melissa Morgan. Honesty night. Remember, if you've got a tip for Melissa, the combination to the lock of that storage unit in Boise, the telemarketer's voice that sounds disturbingly familiar, how to get out of Costco without spending $200 more than you intended, anything. Tell us about it by calling the Tipster hotline at 832-TIPSTER. That's 832-847-7837 or send an email to jttipsters at gmail.com. And now here's your host. She just purchased her third air fryer and it's so big, she's handing out seasoned curly fries to the entire cul-de-sac. Melissa Morgan. More cow bell. All right, look, I sold one of them, okay? Yeah. Look, it's important. Three. <laughs> look. Three. In my defense, I, yeah. st- I started I started with the 2.6 quart, which is a, a, and by Dash. Yes. That makes a lot of little tiny appliances. It's a, adorable, but it's small. And it's probably good for like a half a person or... <laughs> Like if you're a small person or or a, or fair, one. Fair enough. It, maybe if you're like a single person living, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, in an and, apartment and or something. It was a di- like a dial heat thing, a temperature thing. It wasn't digital, but it was inexpensive. I had gotten um, some sort of a notification online. I thought, you know, I'd like to try an air fryer, but I don't want to invest in a big one. Sort of like I did with the pressure cooker that scares me, even though we paid so little for that, but well. at a liquidator. But um, so I buy the little baby dash, and I like it. It's not, you know, it's not as um, precise as a digital one, I'm guessing, but I, you know, it's fine. And it I worked. got, to, it worked fine. And I, uh, I used it literally maybe six times and mostly to make little um, air fried boneless, skinless chicken tenders for uh, Siren Marie Morgan Humphreys. <laughs> well, yeah, but you also made French fries. And... I did, but not really until we got the bigger one. So number two. Uh, I'm driving around and I'm, you know, a bargain hunter and I'm, I got my Bed Bath & Beyond coupon for 20% off and I go and the one I want, they don't have in stock, but they do at the Burbank store. But then he says, you can't use the 20% off coupon. And I'm like, I was unaware that there was anything in Bed Bath & Beyond you couldn't use the coupon for. And you have just made my day terrible, sir, because I'd like to save, you know, 20 bucks or something off of a hundred. And uh, he goes, you know, if you go to Burbank, though, you can use it. And I'm like, what you're telling me is in my own town, I cannot get 20% off of. Anyway, that's, I didn't go. So This is the sound of a, of a crazy shopper person. <laughs> this is the sound of somebody <laughs> who lives to All shop. Right, it's a good story. You just shut up. It's not that much longer. So I do live to shop. So I I was on my, I had looked online. I would pulled over when I got angry at Bed Bath & Beyond and left. And, and I didn't want to drive all the way to Burbank. It's not that far. I was just tired. It was a Sunday. So I pull over in a parking lot and I look and Target has one that's, you know, bigger. It's like a seven quart. And I was like, oh, you know, and it's the Power XL. It's the one I'd watched a lot of videos where people use that one, whatever. So I'm like, oh, Target. Well, right next to Target is Kohl's. And I have a Kohl's coupon. And Kohl's, as we all know, it's a front for something because they sell it's things the for way too cheap. Yeah, but yeah. Anyway. It's pretty much how I've clothed producer Mark's body. Yeah, we don't really care. I'm not, don't get us wrong. Yeah, yeah, we're yeah. fans. We're going we're gonna to take advantage. I make a quick left turn into Kohl's, which is right next to Target, and I bring my coupons and I go in and I get, um, I can't remember if it's like seven... 0.6 quarter, eight quarter. It's a bigger one, right? And I get that for $80. And I'm like, that's great. So, oh, and then I got like Kohl's cash and then I and then I got a shirt and a dress. Anyway, so- Crazy shopping. <laughs> I take that home. We use that one a lot. It's it's bigger. It's digital. Um, it's really nice. It's nice. I like it. So what happens is- Yes. Um, I belong to quite a few couponing groups and be- I think it was your fault because we had just bought the um, HP computer that told me I had no operating system after oh, three days because it was from Best Buy. Okay, so right. I was getting alerts from Best Buy that I didn't didn't really want anymore because they made us so angry. So um, it said one day only the Best Buy brand insignia has a 10 quart digital 
air fryer for $50. It was $150 on sale for $50. And it has, it's like a convection oven. It has the windows in the front. So you can actually see if it has like two, two shelves, you know, and, um, two racks and you the, can the see. The dog is barking at it because they, she thinks it's a chihuahua. That, what are you talking, are you drunk it's right now? It's very big is my point. It's not at all. It's smaller than the other one. It's more compact. You sh- just shut up. You don't even know what you're talking about. So anyway, you can see your food. It is not a Chihuahua. It's actually bigger than a Chihuahua. It's actually bigger than a Chihuahua. Yeah. yeah. You're you're like talking out of your butt and you don't even know. What you're-, you're just trying to shame me and it ain't she, working. She's barking at it because she thinks it's a dachshund. <sighs> so anyway, you can see through it. It's like a convection oven. You can see through the front and um, you can take the... Uh, racks out and it comes with this like um spit and two things to hold it you can do your own rotisserie chicken <laughs> and it turns it's and, big it's big oh shut anyway it's all right. that's, that's, it's all i right. sold the first one to a neighbor on a little sales group and we have two now in case we need backup you're it was a really good purchase you shut up I'm sure it's going to be fine, and uh, and uh, I'm I'm looking forward to our first rotisserie chicken. I'm af- I'm afraid to use it. I'm, no, we're not doing a rotisserie <laughs> chicken. I'm afraid. <laughs> Shut up. We're doing French it's fries. Afraid to use it. I am. It's weird. I have to try it out. We have two nights in a row, been like yeah. we're going to have hamburgers and French fries. No, 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 we're not. We're have salads. We're going to have hamburgers and French fries. No, no, we're going to have pizza. Yeah. So I. I will try it out and let you know because I am excited. I want to be able to see producer Mark and I have a true mixed marriage pretty much on every front. And I like things burnt and crispy and he likes things raw and squishy. So the fact that you can, you know, have two different, um, you know, layers, two different racks of fries or tater tots or onion rings, you know, he can, I can take his out early and keep mine in till they're a little more burnt. So I'm excited about it. You just I, shut up. I am too. It's fine. It's good. I, it's wonderful. Okay, I just, you just shut up. So anyway, three. I don't. Three. What? Three. <laughs> we only have two now. Jesus. Tres. See what I do? I do. I try and do good things for this family, and then I get shamed. <laughs> I, you do wonderful things for uh-huh. this household. Uh-huh. So I'm just saying. Hel- trying to healthier eating. Leveling up, you know, to the to the um, convection oven. I, although it is digital, I'll probably blow it out soon. It's right. Well, that, that's that, but that wouldn't be your fault. That's just my something, electricity. Something about your yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Right. And by the way, before I forget, mentioning in the intro, honesty night, producer Mark and I were watching a an episode of Dateline where a couple um, <laughs> had a friend mediate. <laughs> mediate their honesty oh, night. Oh, that's right. <laughs> honesty night. Yes, where uh one uh partner confessed the all of the infidelities to the other while um while a friend was the mediator and said, "Can you understand why she might be upset that you're fucking another woman?" Do you uh, you go across state lines to fuck uh do you understand? Why? Yeah, that's a good friend there. Yeah. yeah. Honesty night. <laughs> So whatever you have to tell me, Bruce Mark, just keep it to yourself. Let's just live in in a world of lies and smoke and mirrors. And uh, we'll see if that can be arranged. <laughs> <laughs> I do have to say uh, thank you to Tipster Debbie for her sweet email, and I owe you a response back, which I will I will get to. And I promise you, I'm taking care of myself. I it's amazing. I guess I'm just a giant squish monster. And, you know, people are worried about my mental health <laughs> because we cover these stories. And I just, I've, ha- I've had many other podcast hosts who host true crime podcasts who I actually thought would be much tougher than me say, you know, how do you do it? Or not even ask, how do you do it? They say, I'm taking time off. I need to, I need to take time off. And I get that. It, it really hasn't, quote unquote, gotten to me until you know maybe four or five months ago a couple of times i was like this is i need to stop for a while and i i haven't stopped we keep we keep doing episodes of the podcast until someone hears us (laughs) um but you know it is a it is a really good time 
not even if you host a true crime podcast, but if you are just a human being in a, uh, a, a meat suit, your soul is moving in your meat suit and you are having a tough time right now, now's a good time for self-care. So I appreciate Tipster Debbie and, and everyone else who has emailed worrying about me and I promise I'm, I'm fine and I'll let you know if I'm not, but I promise I'm fine. We also owe a special debt of gratitude to our newest patron on Patreon, Christina, uh, tipster Christina with a K. And, um, it's, I don't, I don't understand how the world works, but it's always the people you love and adore who you're like, no, 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 you can't, you can't be a patron. <laughs> And not like, you know, it's the patrons you don't like, you know, it's like you love everyone, but it's, you feel, I feel guilty when it's someone, you this know. This is what you got to get over, baby. I know. I'm working on it. And okay. obviously not, it's not going well, but thank you. I'll just say thank you. Yes. Tipster Christina you. with a K. We really couldn't be, you know, more honored and in awe of your generosity. So I really appreciate that. And we will be covering a case that, tipster christina has admitted uh, a few weeks ago in an email and a wonderful email to us and then she became uh, um our newest patron so thank you for that and a uh the moment everyone's been waiting for uh the winner of the crime scene masks and the bath and body works gift set brrr, tipster allison in missouri and I happen to know via Facebook that she is a an Instagram that she is a very talented artist. She's very creative and very talented. She's uh, young-ish for a tipster, uh, I think 14 or 15, but she's um, very brilliant and very advanced for her age. Um, and she won fair and square. I wrote down all of the names and this contest had more names than any contest we've ever had. And I made producer Mark pull uh, the name out of a, um, of a, just the tipsters baseball hat so yeah, the, the, <laughs> there were so many that they uh, when when melissa was stirring them up to mix them up they kept falling they out. kept falling out on the floor pick them up off the floor and then you know close their eyes and mix them up again yeah but but tipster allison won fair and square and her package i've already notified her via facebook messenger that um her prize package will be in the mail in the next few days and we're really grateful for everyone who entered and yeah, we just, there's no us without you. So thank you, our beautiful tipsters. We've given away, you know, some fun stuff in the past. And I know we'll, we'll be giving away more stuff. And, and uh, tipster Richard gave us some great tips on uh, making you guys work for it. Cause I'm just kind of a lazy butthole. Like here, just say hi and you can have this thing. And it's not like we're going to make you jump through hoops, but you know, you may have to like actually comment on, <laughs> on a post. <laughs> Uh, that would be, that would be good too. I, you guys don't need to work. It's, it's hard enough work listening to this crap. So thank you to my beautiful tipsters. We are really, really grateful. So this is an odd thing. I'm not sure this has ever happened. This will be the second week in a row. We are covering a case where the perpetrator's name is Ken. So last week it was Ken Lumpkin. This week it's Ken or Kenny or Kenneth Wayne Thompson. And you may be familiar with this case if you're from Arizona. You may be familiar with this case if you follow Scientology. It is a very, it's heartbreaking when you hear the details on, there's just, all of this could have been stopped. There's just no way to explain the horror of this kind of a nightmare. You, you've torn apart so many families so many lives, not just the lives you took, but it's, you know, it's a terrible thing. And I don't want to blame a, an organized religion or a belief system because each individual is responsible for their, their own behavior. But I can't help it just from my, you know, limited experience with Scientology having, you know, I, I feel a certain way about this for sure. Uh, there's some great coverage uh, from on medium.com. Delaney Bartlett is a lovely writer. The best and most comprehensive coverage I found was a writer named Richard Rulis. He's a journalist with the Arizona Republic uh, newspaper. And everything I found from him 
Um, I actually just recently started following him on Twitter because he is a, a beautiful writer. He isn't just, um, you know, a black and white journalist. He he has a, a lovely turn of a phrase, especially when it's difficult topics, because I know I don't think crime reporting is his first love. Uh, he uh, is a wine uh, connoisseur. <laughs> And uh, I think that's, you know, I think he's probably much more interested in the gentler arts, but he is, uh, he's a really good r- reporter and a crime reporter at that. Um, the azcentral.com, which is the digital form of the Arizona Republic, really good information. Um, the Daily Beast covered it. And then it just sort of faded away. So this is a bizarre case at best because of the background and because of because of everyone's background quite frankly and I, you know it this isn't a podcast where we delve into the childhood and psychology of every perpetrator and every victim however there are definitely some mitigating circumstances not that it would should or would change the sentence that Kenneth Wayne Thompson eventually got but you can't help but wonder if if certain things didn't contribute to this sort of terrible behavior. So we have to go back a few days before the actual event of the double homicide. On March 14th of 2012, Kenneth Thompson told his wife, Gloria, and their two kids, you know, I'm, uh, I need to make a really short business trip. Uh, from their home in Donovan, Missouri, to his dis- recently deceased parents' uh, home in Memphis. Now, his mother and her third husband died in a terrible motorcycle accident coming back to their home in Memphis from the global headquarters of Scientology in Clearwater, Florida. They had made a pilgrimage on their motorcycles to the mothership and they had died tragically in a terrible accident eight months earlier uh driving home to memphis so so kenneth wayne thompson was on his way according to the story he told his wife to deal with some you know business issues with his parents estate what gloria thompson didn't know is that kenneth wayne thompson had recently purchased a handgun and a burner cell phone, which he took with him. And he left his perfectly working, usable cell phone behind at their home. And he withdrew $10,000 from their bank account. Now, his story is he got to a crossroads on uh, the I-40. And instead of turning one way to go to his parents' home in Memphis, he just headed straight west to Prescott Valley, Arizona, to his sister-in-law's home. But he drove that 1,424 miles in 25 hours. He checked into a motel and rested for a day. The next day, on the 16th, he went to Walmart and he purchased a hatchet and a change of clothes. Sometimes doesn't sound good so far. Yeah, it sounds like a it sounds like a very um, not at all planned out trip, right? You leave your cell phone at home, right? Yeah, yeah, not at all planned. Not premeditated. It was totally, in any way. totally spur of the moment. Totally spur of the moment. He takes a taxi to his sister in law's home, Penelope Edwards. Now, the. Backstory on Penelope is she and Kenneth Wayne Thompson's wife, Gloria, were sisters. And apparently it was a very ugly and contentious relationship. So Penelope had 10 years of a very difficult life. And unfortunately, she had two children that had to go along on that journey. She had a daughter, Devin, and a son whose name was not released because he was underage. But she had these two children, and she had spent time in prison for a drug charge. And while she was in prison, Devin and her younger brother were sent to live with Gloria, her sister. Now, 
I'm not sure how this family is there. I don't want to say they're gypsies, but, you know, Gloria lived in Arizona, Alaska, and then finally Missouri. I believe the kids went with her from Arizona to Alaska. Now, she had custody of them for a while, but Kenneth Wayne Thompson came into their lives about two months before the kids were able to go back and live with Penelope because she had gone through rehab, done her time, and and you'll see was was doing the work. In fact, Penelope's daughter, Devin, says, you know, Ken was in our lives just toward the end of our time with Gloria. Anything Gloria said about my mother was angry and hateful and and mean. And it wasn't like he was a big influence on us. You know, she kept telling us, I want you to meet this guy I'm dating. And, and Gloria had met Kenny online in Alaska. And he came to the house and they were all supposed to be together. And Devin said, well, you know, my brother and I spent time in the living room watching TV and Gloria and Kenny spent all their time together in the bedroom with the door locked. So it's not like he was, you know, he was a big influence. The kids go back to Penelope in Arizona and at at some time in the future, Gloria marries Kenneth Thompson and they have two children of their own and move to Missouri. Now, Devin and her younger brother are in Prescott Valley, Arizona with their mother, Penelope. Penelope meets a man, Troy Dunn, online. And Troy is signing on for a pretty big adventure with Penelope. She is taking parenting classes to be a better parent to her, you know, growing kids who are now teenager and preteen. And he goes and takes therapy before they get married. They're engaged to be a better parent and a better husband. It's more like training or counseling. Penelope goes to therapy with both Devin and her son and goes to therapy on her own. The Apparently, there is a wonderful program in Arizona with the Phoenix Children's Hospital where if your child is having behavioral issues, which the son... Uh, they they assigned a name to him, which is Ben, and I can do that too because it's not his name. So we'll call him Ben. Ben would spend some time every month, um, a few days, sometimes maybe up to a week at the Phoenix Children's Hospital for something called respite care. And that's to give the parents of a child that's acting out some some time And Ben is under psychiatric care, and he is also taking meds that are supposed to help him. And apparently that is what flipped Ken Thompson's switch. He was raised a Scientologist, although that will be debated by his grandmother (laughs) and, and other family members Uh, including his ex-wife. And if you know anything about Scientology, you know that they have a deep abiding hatred for psychiatrist, psychology, anything to do with the brain. And I don't believe, as much as I would really like to blame Scientology for what Kenneth Wayne Thompson did, I I can't. I can't. It's not Scientology's fault. If anyone needed you know, psychological help, it's him. And I don't think he was crazy, but he he definitely needed some help. So Kenneth Thompson, who doesn't really know these kids very well, feels it's his duty to rescue these spiritually compromised children because they're seeing psychiatrists and having, you know, um, appointments with doctors. Now, the daughter Devin was not on medication. She went to a therapist once a week. Seems like it would be a good thing. Your mom spent, yeah. your mom spent time in, in prison for a drug uh, issue. She's working hard. Uh, you know, it, Devin's interpretation of how life was going is vastly 
different than what Kenneth Thompson thought. And he, or says he thought, and he didn't even really know. There wasn't a lot of communication after the kids went back to live with with their mother, Penelope, except that his wife, Gloria, and his words just kept worrying about the soul of the children. The children, they're going to be hurt. It's going to be, you know, terrible. It, it's, it's very heartbreaking. So Kenneth Thompson drives 25 hours to Prescott Valley, Arizona, checks into a motel, takes a nap, goes to Walmart, buys a hatchet and a change of clothes, takes a taxi to his sister-in-law's home, and blessedly... Devin was visiting a friend on spring break and Ben was at his respite care time at the Phoenix Children's Hospital. So the only people that were home were Penelope and her fiance, Troy Dunn. And Ken brings some food. I can't imagine what Penelope Edwards thinks when her brother-in-law from Donovan, Missouri is knocking on her door you know, no warning that he's showing up and, you know, so he shows up, he's there for a few hours, he brought food. And at one point, we know that Penelope Edwards makes a phone call. I don't have the information as to who she calls, but she made one phone call while Kenneth Wayne Thompson is there with her and her fiance, Troy Dunn. And sometime in the afternoon, around 1, 1 1.30, there's smoke rising from Penelope Edwards' home in Prescott Valley, Arizona. And a neighbor who just happens to know who lives there and what's going on, her son is best friends with Troy Dunn. And she can't get a hold of anyone in the house, so she calls her son, Troy's best friend, And says, have you talked to Troy today? And he said, well, no. Why? And his mom said, well, it looks like there's smoke coming from his house. The houses are not that close together. Her son attempts to get a hold of Troy. There's no answer. And they call 911. So when the fire department gets there, they find, of course, Troy Dunn and Penelope Edwards dead on the floor in an odd shape because what had happened was someone had taken a hatchet and cut Penelope over 20 times, including one very large cut to her jugular. Oh my God. And Troy Dunn was also hatcheted to death. He, someone (laughs) then poured acid on the bodies and used flares to start the fire before leaving. Oh, for God's sake. Now this someone, Kenneth Wayne Thompson, is driving a white Ford Taurus and he is pulled over on the side of the freeway. And a state trooper is looking for speeders on the Interstate 40 and he is headed east and he drives by and sees a white Ford Taurus off on the side of the road and he makes note of it because the driver looks something odd about the driver. So the trooper pulls over to start clocking speeders and Thompson had pulled out from being off the side of the road and drove past him. And he was like, okay, this is really weird. He is staring straight ahead. His arms are stiff and stretched out and both hands are on the wheel and he looks um, mesmerized. So the state trooper pulls out and follows him long enough. He wasn't speeding. He was trying to find a reason to pull him over, but he, he figured something out and pulled him over. And at that point, Kenneth Wayne Thompson starts talking and saying, you know, I just came from a wild animal park and, um, the trainers were feeding them um, raw meat. So there's blood uh, on my clothes. <laughs> okay. 
So, uh, so obviously he didn't use the change of clothes that he brought. He did, but there was still some blood on the new change of clothes. <laughs> Great. So he has to keep talking and, and he talks himself in further and further. So now here's, there's a bit of a debate in that, you know, did Kenneth Wayne Thompson give the trooper uh, permission to look through the car? I don't know the vagaries of how that would be a legal thing but if you've pulled someone over and they start talking about why there's blood on their clothes because they came from a wild animal park where a trainer is feeding yeah i think that's probable cause well unless somebody wants to argue that maybe they did the yes they they did in court it didn't work but they did his defense attorneys did argue it producer mark they did i was like i don't understand how anyway the trooper finds in the back of kenneth wayne thompson's white Ford Taurus, diesel fuel and flares, which he had purchased at Walmart, along with the hatchet and the change of clothes. And the hatchet has blood and hair, long hair on the hatchet, which belonged to Penelope Edwards. So while he has Kenneth Wayne Thompson pulled over, he radios into dispatch and is like, look, is there anything weird going on in the area, perhaps involving a hatchet? And they were like, why, yes, trooper. There's As a, a matter of fact. As a matter of fact, there's a fire presently at a home in Prescott Valley, and there's two dead bodies. And he's like, okay, I think I might be on to something here. So he arrests Kenneth Wayne Thompson with probable cause and as he's standing beside the road getting ready to take him in kenneth wayne thompson says the one and only thing he says to the trooper the entire time after he says you know animal park hey does arizona allow conjugal visits in prison i don't know kenny maybe not worrying about your dick right now oh my god i i don't even know yeah. There's no words. Just There's just no words. Really. No. Come on. There, I actually have a whole lot of words, but I don't want to say them all because it would, it would be too much for even the tipsters who hear me say all sorts of words. So he is arrested. Um, he is brought before a grand jury and they say, yeah, yeah, he's, he's going to trial. Uh, he goes uh, to trial and his defense attorney and two court appointed attorneys say in their opening statement, Scientologists think psychology is evil and a scam. Yeah. Tough, yeah, tough, sh tough shit, <laughs> yeah, right? And tough shit. So, and I, I mean, I even hate to agree and give Scientology any credence, but even, even the, um, the DA is like, why is Scientology on trial here? <laughs> Scientology didn't kill Penelope and Troy. <laughs> Ken, exactly. Ken Thompson did. And yeah, I don't want to put Scientology on trial. It's on trial enough. And it should be. It's it's on it should be on trial every minute of every day until it's dismantled and they stop taking people's money and sexually abusing them. Anyway, that's just my opinion. So anyway, uh and then all the Scientology listeners are like, click, click, click. I, I can't help it. I really just you, as long as they don't show up outside the Homestead Studios <laughs> and start, you know, putting putting notes in our mailbox and stuff. Well, I didn't even want to tell the story, but I'm, now I'm going to have to since you've gone there. I used to work for a manager, a uh, talent manager, who managed um, the guys from Spinal Tap and um, David L. Lander, um, who was, you know, friends, very, very good friends with Michael McKeon and Spinal Tap, and they were on Laverne and Shirley. And... David Olander was so much more than the squiggy character on Laverne and Shirley. He was a really good actor and a smart man. He wrote a book, uh, came out in 2012. He passed December of 2020 after a 35 year battle with multiple sclerosis. And his book was entitled something like Fall Down Laughing, How David Olander you know, got MS and didn't tell anyone. 
And I was working for his manager at the time that he had, you know, I was, it was in the mid mid, late nineties actually. And he had had it for 10 years. And I know he would come by the office and drop off, you know, headshots and things that we needed as his management company. And I could tell something was wrong, but I didn't know what it was. I, I, and I sure wasn't going to ask him. He was always the most polite, sweet man, but don't ask me how we got onto a topic one day of Scientology. But David L. Lander tells me, <laughs> you know, he, his name is, his real name is David Landau, and he had been born in New York. And um, when he moved to Los Angeles, it's easy to fall into, especially with actors and creative people, fall into a group of any kind. We've seen it in, in the cults we've covered here. It's a lot of creative, uh, artistic people who are seekers, who want something bigger and better for their lives and who want to believe in something and have that community and all of the things that cults promise. So David Olander was, you know, had been friends with a few Scientologists, but I would call his the, uh, the Scientology gang members. Uh, he said they would go to a large bookstore and go to the psychology section and rip out large parts of books by Freud and Jung. Oh boy! Now, it's chi- it's childish. It's the Scientology version of throwing toilet paper in someone's front yard. I guess it's childish and stupid. I mean, who 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 wins? Yeah, and what minds does it change? It changes no one's mind, and y- you've cost a book company or a bookstore uh, money, and you are destroying property which would be totally against what Scientology believes you don't you know you don't do that look I am a live and let live kind of person uh if you I've said this before and it's just an example I use if you worship a head of lettuce named Steve and Steve brings you peace and comfort that's awesome I'm so glad you and Steve have found each other but I draw the line when you tell me I have to believe in Steve. I'm not really that big of a fan of lettuce. So I don't have to believe in Steve. I can support your belief and and what you get from your head of lettuce named Steve. I don't have to believe in Steve. That's not the way this goes. You don't get to tell me what I do and don't believe in. So I have friends of all faiths and religions and of zero religion <laughs> and faith. <laughs> And I love them all. I don't love one more than the other because of what they believe or do not believe. That is between them and their God or not God. But they don't stay my friend long if they tell me I have to believe in what they believe or I have to believe in nothing. Because that's not their business. That's my business. So the little limited edition that I have of Scientology in my life is my very first friend when I moved to California was from Ohio, neighboring state where I grew up in Kentucky. And we knew each other's area very well. Uh, There was a large age gap, it was like 10 or 15 years difference, but we got along so well. She was my very first friend when I moved here in 1992. And she was a Scientologist. Now she is an actress and she managed her apartment building. And that happens a lot uh, when you work in the creative fields in Los Angeles. Producer Mark lived in a building that I believe was managed or at least overrun by magicians. Yeah, they were most <laughs> they were mostly um, uh, magicians who worked at the Magic Castle in Hollywood. Right, and, and there are so you know there's like um, buildings where a lot of actors end up living because hey, you know what? There's an apartment for rent. You know, it's it's a it's a thing. And there were a lot of creative people in the building that this woman managed, and she was very close to the big Scientology Center on Sunset in in Hollywood. Now, I applauded her desire to have something larger in her life. I didn't know a lot about Scientology, and I quite frankly didn't care. One of the things I respected about her was that I could tell she was a seeker. When she first came to Los Angeles, you know, many years before I did, she was a Buddhist. And, and she had been raised hardcore Catholic in, um, you know, just north of Cincinnati in Ohio. And I think she 
you know, a lot of a lot of people who are raised in a very strict religious household, you know, rebel against that. And you you get that. That's why, you know, I think religion, you know, should be laid out for kids when you think it's time, if that's what you want to do, and allow them to make their own decision when they're old enough to. So she she left that religion, uh, Catholicism, and she tried many different things moving to L.A. She she is an open minded seeker. It's one of the things I adore about her. But when she became more militant about Scientology, and one instance that is a big influence in my brain as my first or second year here, she hosted a Thanksgiving and I'd never, you know, first couple of years, I didn't have the money to go back home to Kentucky for holidays. And, uh, which by the way, uh, sidebar, uh, Kentucky, you should batten down the hatches. I'll be there in June, um, of 2021. So Look out. here we go. So she, uh, allowed me, <laughs> invited me to her home for Thanksgiving. And everyone else there was a Scientologist. Some were from Clearwater, Florida, visiting California. Some were from Australia, visiting California. And and then there's Maud. Here, here's me. Do, 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 do. Where's the turkey? And they were all speaking in a language. I didn't, you know, Thetans and whatever. And I was, I did feel uh, less than, but not her fault. That was my, you know, I could have just been like, we all talk about, but I didn't, I just was, I would listen and be like, okay, whatever. Um, the next day, the Friday after Thanksgiving, she said, I have some leftovers I want to bring to your house. And I was like, great. She dropped them off. And on top was a very thick envelope. And it was a 14 page letter, single spaced telling me that my behavior at Thanksgiving, you know, was very telling and that I had terrible relationships with men um, and that I was a suppressive person and I needed to go to Scientology and get audited to clear out the, you know, demons that were in my head. So, no, that wasn't going to happen. She ended up going to Australia for a few years to study. Um, I was fine with not, not being in her life and her being in my life. And when she got back home, she, um, said, I'd like to have dinner with you. And I was like, okay. But I put up my shit shield and wasn't going to, wasn't going to take anything. And we had dinner and I finally just said, you know, you were my first friend here and you hurt me badly with that ridiculous letter and your demand that I join Scientology. And she started crying and said, you know, I'm sorry, and I never meant to hurt you. And I believe that. I know that. I know she's a good, kind person. And she continued to be in Scientology for the next, I don't know, 20-something years. She just recently left a few years ago, and I believe, honestly, it all comes down to the Leah Remini uh, documentary series. And and I there's pictures of of this friend in line at a book signing, uh, getting Leah Remini to sign her book and saying, I, I drank the Kool-Aid. I too drank the Kool-Aid. So, you know, you, I don't care what you think. If you think Scientology is not a cult, you and I are not going to agree. I think it's a cult. It can be classified a religion all at once. You can say every religion's a cult. I don't care. Fine with me. It's, you can believe what you believe and I'm going to believe what I'm going to believe. And we're not going to fight about it. But I can tell you that Scientology has incorporated all of the terrible things that organized religion offers and not a lot of the good. They have sexually abused members. They have tortured members. Sound familiar? I know it happens in every religion. I get it. And I don't I don't want to sit here and debate what's a religion and what's a cult because Scientology was classified a private religion so they could have a a better tax status. And it was a big win. I remember when that happened in the 90s because my friend was just overjoyed. And I remember thinking, you make so little money scratching by as the manager of your apartment building and trying to get acting gigs. And they want a lot of it for these classes. And these classes sounded crazy to me, 
crazy classes, things they made you do, things they told you that you had to just take on as truth. So I'm just going to tell you that's my experience, my little bit of experience with Scientology. We have friends who are still Scientologists. We know a lot of people who are still Scientologists. We don't discuss things like that because it's like politics, politics and religion. The older I get, the less I want to talk to most people about that. That's their business. And, and my business is my business. So I just felt like I needed to tell that story. So anyway, testimony in Kenneth Wayne Thompson's trial is probably more interesting than in a lot of trials, you know, like the Twinkie defense. Um, there's a lot of things that people have used in their lifetimes to defend themselves against uh, the charge of uh, murder and especially a double homicide with a hatchet, flares, diesel fuel, and a ridiculous thought process. So <laughs> the only person that the defense could find that would actually get on the stand because they attempted to get a hold of Leah Remini and um, another blogger who I guess talked about Scientology. But this professor, associate professor at uh, Canadian College, uh, and she's written a couple of, she, she was a co-author of a paper called Patterns of Sexual Abuse in Religious Settings. And she's the author of a book called Scientology in Popular Culture. And it's, you know, like about Scientology's battle to be le considered legitimate. So S Dr. Susan Rain is on the stand uh, for the defense saying for, for like uh, half a day, it was half a day testimony in this trial, talking about, you know, she's kind of a, considered an expert on Scientology. And she says, you know, um, Scientology represents psychologists as a conspiratorial group that are trying to take over the world. Sound familiar? Dr. Rain says that, you know, uh, it's, it's even worse if psychology is being practiced on children. And someone who really believes in Scientology with both feet in would see that a child's salvation is on the line and their survival is in jeopardy. You know, it's, and the reason is, and it, and she, you know, spent half a day on the stand explaining, <laughs> explaining um, Battlefield Earth or whatever that shitty movie with John Travolta, which I guess is really based on what L. Ron Hubbard believes that, you know, many years ago, uh, a planet was overfilled and he, you know, Xenu, the, the warlord brought millions or perhaps billions of, of people to planet Earth and threw them into volcanoes and then, and then, you know, gave them hydrogen bombs. And the ones that survived are called Thetans. So it's like planet Earth, I guess, is the dumping ground for all bad demons. And you have to become a Scientologist and hold on to two tomato soup can things that an e-meter that reads your level of demonology and then when you take a bunch of classes and pay for those you are then deemed clear so which we have friends who are in a band named clear which was hilariously funny and they're brilliant and creative human beings but what being a satan <laughs> which is what i was called at thanksgiving and didn't know <laughs> what that meant uh if you don't clear a child from these demons, it would jeopardize their ability to reincarnate. So you just come back all the time as a different soul. You know, you're just reincarnated over, you know, millennia. Your spirit is reincarnated many thousands of times during the history of this, you know, of our cosmos. Um, and, and Dr. Rain's, uh, synopsis the goal of scientology more broadly is to free you from the negative consequences of these implants this negative energy now i was called a suppressive person not that long ago by my friend who was still a scientologist at the time and she pulled that out because i had invited her to an event at our home and she didn't show up 
and I texted her because I thought something was wrong. She was, you know, a single person living alone in Hollywood and I wanted to make sure she had, you know, car trouble or something. So I texted her and I was like, oh, you're, so you're not coming? And she was like, oh, I, I just forgot. And when I was like, oh, okay, well, that hurt. Then I became a suppressive person and I got a long email about how I'm, um, I'm not going to guilt her. I was like, but you fucked up. Just say you're sorry. You wouldn't even say you're sorry. All you did was be, oh yeah, I forgot. Well, that's, you know, anyway, it, it was only a few years after that, that, that she cut ties with Scientology, but, but, but not before throwing in that I'm a suppressive person. And because I ask for, (laughs) for some sort of like response when you just don't show up and I care enough to call you in the middle of a party to make sure you're okay. And you're just like, Oh gosh, I just forgot. Well, how about, I'm sorry. I forgot. Could you just say that? Am I asking too much? And, and that I don't want your answer. Don't tell me if you think I am. So a suppressive person is a degraded person, according to Scientology, uh, because quite honestly, it's because you dare to question their belief system. It's, you know, it's like saying, if you believe us, you're one of us. And if you don't, you're the devil. Well, fuck off. I mean, that's bullshit. That's why I'm saying I'm a, I'm a very live and let live kind of person. I really, I really am. I don't care what you believe, but please don't tell me I have to believe what you believe. I can support you and your beliefs. That's totally fine. I, you know, I may not uh, want to talk to you about Xenu and I think we're all turtle people or something too. There was some sort of a turtle. Anyway, um, I don't, I really don't want to get too far afield. I really, really don't. So Kenneth Wayne Edwards defense team says that this was just a spur of the moment thing. It was a rescue mission, you know, to get these two kids that he wasn't really close to away from his, you know, sister-in-law. She is, you know, a terrible person. Um, you know, he, leaves his cell phone at home. He drives 25 hours. He could have stopped at any time. He takes a day at a motel to sleep. He could have changed his mind anytime. He goes to Walmart and buys um, a hatchet, clothes. Oh yeah, it's, come on. It's totally premeditated. <laughs> right? it's, come on. <laughs> right. Well, his attorney says, this is not evidence of premeditation. This just shows how seriously he took his religious belief that the children were receiving mental health treatment and their spirituality was in peril and they needed to be rescued. Uh, and so, and therefore he premeditated their assassination. No, Mark. Why are you not understanding? Yeah, I guess, I guess, I guess I'm just stupid. Yeah. It's, it's the, it's all the Satan in me, I guess. You're, it's all the Satan in you. It's, it's the Satan and it's the, it's the, it's, it's the Satan Thetan. It's the it's satanic Thetanism. You're the Satan Satan. Yeah, that's me. You're something like that. Oh, okay. Yeah. Oh, they're really coming by putting stuff on our mailbox now. Oh, okay. Well, you know, our uh, HOA is changing out our mailboxes. Maybe we'll get the one that locks. Let's hope. Yeah, we'll get that one. Uh, so, at. Uh, Believe it or not, Kenneth Wayne Thompson actually takes the stand in his own defense. And he speaks directly to the jury for four hours. Oh, that's got to go over well. Yeah. Oh, that's going to just, that'll do the trick right there. Yeah. And he tells the jury through his attorney's questioning, you know, what's the $10,000 for? Oh, uh, 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 I was going to buy the happiness of these two children. I was going to give $10,000 to this drug addict, you know, their mother. And, and say, give me the kids. I, but I wasn't going to flee to Mexico or anything. Or whatever. Or I don't whatever. Even know what he was. Yeah. He didn't know what he was going to do, honestly, I think. You know, uh, Penelope Edwards hurt her kids all of the time. And Troy hurt kids, too. He was not a good guy. There is zero evidence. There is zero evidence of anything bad or wrong going on after Penelope got out of prison and went full bore into trying to be... A good parent. In fact, it's just the opposite. Devin, the daughter who was at her friend's house for spring break, said, you know, um, I, I it was amazing when we got to come back home. You know, mom opened up the door to this wonderful apartment. For the first time in our lives, we had our own bedrooms every night 
we sat down together as a family, mom, Troy, me, and Ben, and had dinner. We talked about what was going on in our lives freely and openly. We got to pick out our own furniture. This was the most happy, stable family life we'd ever had. Oh, this just breaks your heart. This it breaks just your heart so in half. Even Devin as a teenager said, my mom was working so hard. She got really better at learning how to, I won't say subdue Ben, but keep him so he wouldn't hurt himself or anyone else. I mean, it just... Yeah, that's just really being cruel to him. Yeah. It, it's right, right. For the first time, they have normal lives. They're getting psychiatric help, which, you know, apparently they really needed after after what, you know, they'd been through. But they were, you know, growing to trust their mom again. And, I mean, I just don't... Yeah. So a spokesperson for Scientology says it's irresponsible and dangerous for Kenneth Thompson's attorneys to make Scientology the convenient scapegoat for their clients' actions when there's zero evidence to support it. Now, that statement is is true. It's very um, lawyerly <laughs> and, you know, obviously written by one of the many attorneys that the Church of Scientology employs. And during cross-examination, even the Yavapai County District Attorney Robert Johnson asked Susan Rain, is this a desperate attempt by the defendant to avoid conviction by using Scientology? Now, one of Thompson's defense attorneys objects before she can answer. And the judge did say, you know, that's an, impo an improper question. And Susan Rain apparently really wanted to answer that. And she goes, can, can, I, can I actually respond to that? And the judge said no. Yeah, it, it's a, you can't ask, ask that question. Yeah. Well, under cross-examination, you know, she said, I haven't read the police reports and I didn't interview Thompson. I'm here just because of my research and I'm an academic about religion. So in the closing arguments, Deputy Yavapai County Attorney Steve Young asked jurors, you know, why do you think you heard about Scientology? Why is Scientology even injected into this trial? Scientology is not on trial. The defendant is. Scientology did not kill Penelope and Troy. The defendant did. At one point, Kenneth Thompson holds up a pad with something written on it and gives it to his attorney, Gregory Parzich. And he asks Susan Rain, uh, what about the free zone Scientology group. Now, that's a splinter group that broke off after they found out, you know, after they hid, they hid the fact that L. Ron Hubbard had been dead for, I don't know, a year and a half. But after it was finally announced that he had passed and David Miscavige had taken over as chief executive officer, this splinter group broke off. They still believe everything L. Ron Hubbard said, but they don't follow David Miscavige. And I guess he wanted that known that there was this splinter group. And it just, it really didn't help his defense. Even his ex-wife, Gloria, who, you know, by this time had divorced him because he killed her sister, uh, said that, you know, he really stopped advancing in Scientology, partly because it's so expensive. Really? Also by the fact that they lived in Donovan, Missouri, and the closest Scientology church was in Poplar Bluff, Missouri, but it had closed. So she didn't even know where he would have still continued to practice Scientology. So jury members were told that they could consider only the testimony about Scientology to help determine if Kenny Wayne Thompson, you know, if this influenced his motives. They could not use it to conclude that he was incapable of forming the requisite mental state required for these criminal charges. So even Kenneth Wayne Thompson's grandmother... Mrs. Harvey said, you know, he was a really good little kid. I mean, he may have been kind of awkward. He was diagnosed with Asperger's. Yeah, so are a lot of people. They don't kill two family members. And when a reporter asked, was was Ken a Scientologist? She laughed and said, he's Baptist. 
So I don't huh. write. Okay. So in February of 2019, it took not that long at all for a jury to find him guilty of first degree double murder as well as some other charges, some burglary and uh, arson. And then in April of 2019, he was sentenced to death for the double homicide, which that is the part uh, in, in Arizona, I believe it's lethal injection. That is the part that I was a little surprised by. I thought he would probably get life in prison, but also, um, this is a legal question, producer Mark. In every state, does the jury um, decide the sentence? I don't believe so. I, don't I didn't believe, think so I don't either. believe it's true of, in every state, but I don't know for sure. I don't know for sure either, but I found it odd that the jury, you know, was impaneled and, and heard the entire case. And then after they, um, you know, pronounced him guilty of, of double murder, it took about two weeks where they then had to get together again to decide the, the, the penalty, sentence. The yeah. penalty phase. Yeah, right. Yeah. So do they get to go home? I think so. I don't think they're sequestered during the penalty phase. I, I, yeah, it was very, it's very interesting to me that the way each state, you know, I'm not saying the entire country should be under one sort of rule, but then again, it may be it's something to be considered because each state, you know, becomes its own little fiefdom. And we've seen that in, you know, law enforcement agencies not communicating, whether it's competition for who solves what fastest. And and criminals aren't stupid anymore. I mean, not that they ever were, but they're less stupid now. <laughs> criminals are more educated. <laughs> and even the ones who, you know, may not know a lot or haven't gone to law school know that if you cross state lines, it's going to be different. Sometimes if you cross a different city, a different county, you know, it may take longer for them to catch you because of different jurisdictions. That's why I thought it was pretty interesting that the only question Kenneth Thompson asked the trooper was, hey, does Arizona allow conjugal visits in, uh, in prison? I'm not sure uh, Gloria Thompson's coming to see you, Ken. Evidently she didn't. Yeah, no, she's no longer Gloria Thompson. Maybe he was thinking, well, at some point I'll I'll marry somebody else. There'll be, you know, there'll be some some freak who'll write me a letter and, you know, marry me in jail or something. Yeah, maybe it'll be someone, you know, who's a big follower of Xenu. <laughs> One never knows. Yeah, maybe Tom Cruise can hook him up. Okay, uh, many letters in our mailbox <laughs> now. Well, I'm telling you, in the trial, uh, the name Tom Cruise was used, uh, I think because of that very famous NBC Today Show interview where he, it was 2005, I think, he totally, you know, railed against psychology. I can't remember who was interviewing him, but he was, you know, psychology was was the devil. I'm going to go out on a limb and say there are probably really bad psychologists out there. Uh, and, yes. And and there are probably really good psychologists out there. You think? I do. And I think that if you or someone that you know needs help, you will absolutely consider calling someone for help. And I hope that if you have a belief system that says that asking for help outside of that belief system is not right, that you will consider changing that belief system and that you will reach out and get the help you need. Please know you can always email us at jttipsters at gmail.com and you can call us at 832-847-7837 and more cowbell. And if you'd like to support Just the Tipsters, go to patreon.com forward slash Just the Tipsters.